do as host and but uh, somebody who can can help us to uh, uh, contact contact um, presenters, um, give them instructions, and be in communication with them. Make sure that all of the all of our uh, I's are dotted and our T's are crossed. So if you're interested in that kind of position, uh, please get in touch. We really we really we really need it. Uh, we we need a kite production assistance or assistance. Uh, to help with the uh, with the newsletter effort, and we have a very skeleton crew right now, and we could really use some help there. Uh, we need community outreach event staffers. We are hoping to get back in the business of staffing community events uh, with a table tabling. Whoops, sorry. Uh, uh, we hope hoping are able, we're, we hope to be able to do multiple events per weekend sometimes, as they sometimes happen, particularly in the spring. Uh, we also need plants for birds, garden stewards. Uh, some of our, our garden at uh, Pine Jog uh, need some tender loving care. We could use some volunteers out there. And uh, we also are will be putting in another garden at uh, Bush Wildlife Refuge sometime pro probably in the winter. So we'll need help there in garden stewards. And again, as always, kite contributing writers. So if, again, if you're interested in any of those, please don't hesitate to contact at info at audubonneverglades.org. Uh, we are, we have finished our membership drive, but that doesn't mean you can't become a member. Uh, uh, to renew your dues, just go to audubonneverglades.org and just click on the membership button and you can renew your membership with us. We would love to have you back if you have not rejoined yet. If you have rejoined, thank you so much. We, we love having you as members and all of your dollars go to support our programs and volunteer efforts and conservation efforts. Again, this is an all volunteer organization. Everything that every that happens here is done by volunteers. Uh, the 2022-23 photography uh, group season is coming up. We're very excited. The new meeting date is the second to Thursday of each month. Uh, this works well for the people who are organizing the event. And so we have changed the date. Uh, Thursday, September 8th, we're having a kickoff meeting. And that's a photo sharing stories behind getting the photographs and all are welcome to come and see. To be able to show your photographs and tell your story, uh, be sure to become a member of AEPG and you can register at AEPG register at audubonneverglades.org. Mary will be putting that information into the chat. So you don't have to copy it and write it down right now. It'll be there for you. It's already in there, Mary says. That's great. And I know I plan on sharing. Mary and I went to Iceland uh, this past summer, this past summer, no, still the summer, last month. And uh, I'm going to be sharing some of our, our puffin photos. So I'm sure you'll love, you. who doesn't like seeing puffin photos? Come on. They're like the cutest, the cutest bird ever. So I will be sharing some of those in the story that went into getting those photographs. Uh, conservation. So uh, I've talked about this before. The uh, Palm Beach uh, County Board of County Commissioners are finally going to be, it seems, voting on the GL Homes request, unless GL Homes has suddenly pulls it at the last minute. Right now it's on the agenda for August 31st. It's also on the agenda for August 12th for the uh, Palm Beach County Planning Commission meeting. Um, again, GL Homes is looking to do a land swap. Uh, they're looking to uh, swap land in, um, in the, um, what's in the, I'm sorry, I'm trying to remember the area. Uh, Anyway, in these western, western, north, in the western Palm Beach County area for land in the uh, agricultural reserve. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, they have, um, they're trying to uh, convince the uh, county to do that, to make that change, because under the current um, comprehensive plan, that kind of development, that kind of condensed development is not allowed. So they are um, enticing them with. Uh, Things like 30 acres of land for a little for a community area, uh, the, the promise of a hundred acre of passive passive park, which perhaps in the not too distant future they'll ask to be they'll ask to develop that park again. 
Um, and um, so we're hoping that you all will uh, both write the legislators, I mean, excuse me, write the commissioners or call them or attend the meetings, better yet. And I've given the dates of both those meetings and their locations. Uh, I will put that information in the chat as well. I will also be sending out a notice uh, through Constant Contact, that's the email uh, account that we use to everyone, to give you some argumentative points. And I'm gonna show you just some of them real quickly. Um, I, uh, to be able to uh, compose, to use to compose your letter or to use to compose your argument if you should attend uh, either of these two meetings. And so those are, those are right here. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why this is a bad idea. Um, and uh, these are just uh, nine of them or 10 of them that I came up with. Uh, and I'm gonna share these with you um, in a uh, email. And so look for that. Uh, it'll be it'll be uh, uh, probably titled uh, something to do with the Act Reserve. Okay, so that's that's coming to a mailbox to an email box near you. Uh, on September sixth, we have our next program. That's next month, and we have a really exciting speaker, speaker, Dr. George Archibald, who is the co-founder of the International Crane Foundation, which was founded I think over forty years ago. Uh, who who of course is also an author. And the presentation is Whooping Cranes Are Still Whooping, A Remarkable Recovery of the Whooping Cranes. If you love cranes, and I, who doesn't, I know you won't want to miss this presentation. Uh, he is a legend, uh, and we are so excited to have him as our, as our future speaker for, for September. So don't miss that presentation. Uh, to see all of our presentations, in case you do miss them, you can go to our YouTube channel. You can just go to YouTube and, and type in uh, 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 Audubon Everglades um, channel and you should come up with it or Mary will put that channel into the chat. So you can just copy it and paste it into your email browser and click on it and you'll be able to see all our past programs, including all of our past photography programs. So, we're getting ready for our programs. I know you're excited to have me stop talking and to hear, the, hear our presenters. So if you have questions for our presenters, please put them into the chat at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you're on a computer, I think it's for the top if you're on a, uh, like an iPad or something. And uh, we will try to get to all your questions uh, as, as best we can and get them answered for you with our, from our brilliant presenters. So to get the, the evening rolling, we have our bird of the month with Clive and CC Pinnock. And I know you'll be excited to see them. They won't be here next month, by the way. Clive is going to be and Cece are going to be in Texas for a wedding at that time. So uh, we will try to fill in that space with something interesting. We'll see what we can come up with. But we do have a bird of the month for you this month. And so I give you Clive and Cece Pinnock. Clive? You can share your screen and turn on your, your, your audio. Scott, can you enable us again? We got kicked out a while ago. You got kicked out. Yeah, yeah. so we're not hosts. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. Uh, I'm trying to find you. Can you find Clive? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> there you go. You can you can uh, you can share your screen now, Clive. Thank you. Oh, okay. Great. All right, everybody. Um, thank you so much for uh, coming up and taking a look at uh, our bird of the month. Um, uh, so here we go. Um, for those of you who may not have actually gone out west before to see this bird, um, it is tremendous to, to get a glimpse of it. And I use the term glimpse uh, um, with uh, significance because the bird is a hider, uh, if I can create that word. Uh, this is the chucker. Chuckers actually uh, live in our Midwestern and actually Western states. And uh, they're actually native to Pakistan and Iraq. They're the uh, um, national bird 
of Pakistan and Iraq. Um, birds are quite beautiful. Uh, they're about the size of a Cornish game hen, uh, about 14 inches all told from tip, tip of beak to the tip of the tail. And you'll notice the vibrant colors on the bird. Uh, that white throat uh, can sometimes be uh, a tan uh, in color. And um, those, the bars on the flanks really highlight the, uh, the bird's character. Um, uh, here's a, a little better um, uh, shot of just how the birds look. Uh, came up with the schematic here at the bottom showing the red bill, the white throat, which I some, uh, mentioned sometimes can be tan, that black necklace, the flanks and uh, red feet. Uh, there's also a, a red eye ring, which uh, highlights the birds quite a bit. There's actually no significant difference between male and female. And um, with the exception that the males are sometimes just uh, a tad larger than the females. And if you get a chance to see them up close, which is uh, infrequent, the males do have spurs at the base of their feet, uh, at uh, the back of their legs, I should say. Um, the bird on the right is the male and you can barely make out the spurs because of where the bird is there. I can go back to the original um, photo and you could see the spurs on the backs of the uh, legs of the, this male. Again, these are called chucker. Um, quite interesting birds. They uh, uh, live in the uh, desert regions. Uh, generally, um, let me see, get my range map here. Uh, they were brought here to the United States as a game bird in 1893 and were not very successful at the time. However, uh, the uh, hunters wanted to try them again. And so they, the introduction process started over in earnest in uh, 1931 and continued through 1970. And with that, the population uh, has really taken off in those uh, shaded states that you see there. They're holding their own quite well in California, uh, Nevada, uh, some sections of Arizona, um, throughout Utah, we've got um, uh, Oregon, Washington, uh, Idaho, parts of Wyoming and Montana as well. So they're pretty well established throughout those areas. Um, the habitats that these birds tend to frequent are some are listed here as shrublands, uh, rocky slopes, uh, hillsides, uh, steep grasslands, uh, barren plateaus, and deserts. They love canyon country and they blend in their colors, uh, cause them to blend in very, very well with the habitat. Now these birds being ground dwellers would uh, prefer to run or walk uh, than uh, fly. Uh, they are capable of flight, but the flights are usually reserved for uh, panic situations. So if they um, uh, are frightened, by something, some type of predator or whatever, they will take a, a burst uh, flight and make it, but it's usually very, very short. Their wings are rounded and, uh, and broad. And so they're able to do these explosive flights like most quail or uh, birds of that, that type. Um, they uh, uh, feed predominantly, the adults, I should say, feed predominantly on vegetation. Uh, they like sagebrush. They uh, scour the ground looking for seeds, grasses, um, different types of forbs. They've got flowering heads of different types of plants, uh, seed heads. They feed quite a bit on, on that. Uh, they, in their feeding forays, will scratch about quite a bit. Um, they like to uh, roost at night under uh, hedges and rocks, things of that sort. Um, they begin their nesting season in the spring and um, usually during late summer and throughout the fall and winter months, they form what's called cubbies. These are family groups that sometimes it's the individual male and female, but then uh, a lot of those families um, 
groups will join together and stay together during the winter months. And then uh, in the spring, the pairs will break off. Uh, pairs are monogamous just for the breeding season. And uh, generally when a male separates from the rest of the coveys, uh, he will establish a territory by calling. Uh, an interested female will respond to the call. Um, there's a bit of courtship uh, display that's involved. And uh, once uh, the, the, the birds uh, decide to establish themselves as a pair, they consummate that with mating. Um, the female then sets about uh, building a nest. It's usually a scrape in the ground. Uh, that nest is lined with a lot of leaves and grasses and breast feathers. On average, six to 14 eggs are laid. However, they can actually, the female can actually lay somewhere up to 20 or sometimes a little bit more. The eggs are off white uh, or cream in color. They're sometimes yellowish buff and they're spotted with uh, brownish or yellowish spots. I don't know if you can see the uh, spots there on that photograph um, with the hen sitting on uh, all those eggs. Uh, chicks hatch out in 22 to 24 days. Uh, usually it's the female that does the incubating. However, uh, there are times that the males will stick around and assist with nesting and uh, caring for the young. Uh, the young are precocial, meaning that they, um, uh, soon after they're hatched, they're ready to leave the nest. They're hatched uh, fully covered with down, their eyes are open, and within an hour or so, they're out of the nest. Uh, either the uh, adult female or if she's joined by the male, they will lead uh, the chicks around to potential feeding locations, but it is the chicks that actually feed themselves. The young feed primarily on insects for the most part because the protein source is really important for them as far as growth, bone development, things of that sort. Um, now, generally the uh, chuckers, because they live in very arid zones, usually don't stray very far from water and will go to quite the extremes to locate water from time to time. One of the uh, things that I learned in this is that they will even go in mine shafts uh, underground up to 10 feet to try to locate a uh, water source in those areas. You can see in the lower left there, a hen with uh, one of her chicks um, uh, at a very, very shallow uh, remnant left over from probably uh, a rain shower, but you can see them uh, drinking there. And the uh, lower uh, right shows two of the chicks. And finally, um, I wanted to mention here too, not only about the birds, forming coveys at the end of the nesting season, but they also do something quite uh, interesting. They love taking dust baths. Uh, that lower left photograph shows them actually making uh, shallow scrapes and throwing dust and dirt over themselves. And it actually helps tremendously in uh, taking care of their feathers, ridding their feathers of globs of oil, as well as feather mites. Um, in closing, I just want to read the conservation note here. Uh, chuckers were introduced to the United States from Pakistan in 1893, but few survived. Between 1931 and 1970, additional introductions in the Western United States helped establish wild populations in 10 Western states. Some include California, Idaho, Nevada, Colorado, Montana, and others, as well as British Columbia in Canada. Uh, chuckers are successfully colonized as well in the six main islands in Hawaii after introductions in the 20th century. And they are common in Western states and British Columbia, as I mentioned before. Um, the populations are considered stable uh, from about 1968 to 2015, according to North American Breeding Bird Survey. Partners in Flight establishes a global breeding population of about 9 million birds, and the species rates a 6 out of 20 on the continental concern uh, scope, which means it is not on the Partners of Flight watch list. 
And so there we have it, a little uh, bit of information about uh, quite a, uh, an interesting bird. If you get a chance to go out to the deserts of Arizona, Utah, Colorado, um, it's a challenging bird to locate. Again, not only because they are so secretive in nature, but their colors blend in with the terrain quite well. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Claude. What a fascinating bird. And uh, I, I honestly had never even heard of them prior to your to, to hearing about your presentation. Yeah, I was fortunate in that with my work with the National Park Service at Glen Canyon, um, I uh, did quite a bit of field work uh, in Utah, as well as in Northern Arizona. And I would get occasionally get glimpses of these birds. And in the spring, um, hearing the males do their typical chucker call, which is where they derive the names. That's uh, that was a dead giveaway that they were in the area. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. So if you have questions for Clive, please put them in the chat. Uh, we are getting some questions, so I'm going to start uh, uh, asking you some of them, Clive. So do they compete? A ch uh, cherry patilla wants to know: Do they compete with native avian species? No, there are a few uh, native uh, birds in those areas that fill that particular niche. So there's very little, if any, competition at all. There are native quails, like gambles quails and such, but um, these birds uh, tend to inhabit the high desert region of those areas. And uh, in extreme winter months, when there's a lot of snowfall, they may drift down into towns and uh, dry pasture lands, but for the most part, they're in the high, uh, high mountain desert regions. Okay, and I just have kind of a follow-up. Um, so who, who predates on them? Who predates on these, on the chuckers? Actually, there are hawks, uh, quite a few desert hawks uh, that will feed on them. Uh, there are great horned owls that uh, feed on them, as well as coyotes and uh, other mammals, uh, foxes and coyotes mm -hmm. that, uh, and of course, desert, uh, the cougars will go after them as well. And are they considered a game bird that are, are open to hunters as well? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, that's why they were brought to the United States yeah. to help enhance uh, game bird hunting. I see. That's what I, that's what I suspected. Yeah. Uh, so other questions. Uh, do, the, do you think they act like prairie chickens? This is from Kay Gates. Well, um, prairie chickens establish a lek which is usually a location where the males uh, do their strutting and do their calls to call females in. However, uh, once the, um, the birds break up uh, in the springtime, once the chuckers break up from their coveys in the springtime to establish uh, breeding territories, it's the lone male that will go to a territory call a female and a single female will respond. So they are monogamous during the breeding season. Oh. Um, so they don't establish a lek like the prairie chickens and others would do. Interesting, thank you, Clive. Uh, so um, Cal Rosowski says, we've seen them in Southern Israel in, in the Negev region. So yes, they, they, are, are, they are in many of the Middle Eastern uh, countries, oh. uh, Pakistan, as I mentioned before, Iraq, but certainly other, a lot of the other Middle, Middle Eastern regions that have uh, habitats, uh, high, dry, rocky regions, the birds just absolutely thrive in those areas. And Scott Schinhaus says they look like the red-legged partridge in Okeechobee County. Yes, as a matter of fact, they are closely related to the red-legged partridge and uh, there are regions in our country, especially in Western states, where the partridges have been released as well, where they do hybridize. Oh. So from time to time, yeah. If you were to see a photograph of the partridge, and in hindsight, I should have popped one in there, but uh, they look very, very similar. However, um, what is highlighted is the uh, collar, um, that neck collar is very different in the partridge uh, compared to the chucker. So, Oh, so the hybridized version would have a different neck color because that's that was my next question. Because so that's what they would look like. It's actually a combination, a little bit of combination of both. Some you will see the more dominant black band 
that you uh -huh. see in the chart. Others, you would see the more dominant speckled broken black band that you would get in the red-legged partridge. So it varies. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. And also June Porter, thanks you for sharing about the Chuckerbird Clive, and I'm sure everyone else uh, does as well. That was a great presentation. Thank you so much. We're going to miss you next month, but enjoy Texas and enjoy whose ever wedding you're going to. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Maybe I'll get a chance to see some Chucker out there. That's true. I hadn't thought of that. That's so exciting. <laughs> get some photos, bring them back. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> okay. Thank All you, right. Clive. Have a great night. Thank you. You too. All right. Uh, Okay. All right, so uh, we have our feature speaker and to introduce her, we have board member Autumn Quixote, uh, sometimes known as Professor Screech, but now she's, but for, for, for tonight, she's Autumn Quixote, <laughs> who, will, who will be introducing her. Autumn, take it away. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, so a lot of you know Natasha. Um, we hope you do. She's pretty amazing. She's, um, aside from being on the board and our vice president, she is a wildlife biologist with over 10 years of experience working with threatened and endangered species here in Florida. And she's got a bachelor's in biological sciences, a master's in environmental science, and they're both from uh, FAU where she specialized in sea turtle conservation research. So when you guys were talking about uh, the night heron picking off the sea turtles, I was thinking of her while you guys were talking about that. Um, she went to work for the Florida Park Service as a park services specialist at Jonathan Dickinson, um, where she was coordinating research and college interns at the parks and assisting with the outreach and the education. My friend, uh, Sarah does that. Um, she then went on to, um, work as the assistant regional biologist for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, she worked with federally listed terrestrial species here in South Florida. And now she's a wildlife biologist with the South Florida Water Management District where she works in uh, the Ecosystem Restoration and Capital Projects Division, um, assisting in um, and helping in multiple aspects of large scale Everglades restoration projects. And today she's gonna talk about that um, working on those projects and um, the benefit from these projects and then describe how the, the STAs are designed and all the stuff that goes into creating them. So it's gonna be a pretty exciting, um, exciting meeting, I think. So take it away, Natasha. Thanks, Autumn. All right, so I'm gonna see if I can share my screen. I did this successfully earlier. <laughs> All right, so can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. All right, perfect. Can't wait for the day where we don't have to ask that question anymore. <laughs> All right, well, so thank you so much, Autumn. Uh, that was a lovely introduction. Sarah's amazing. I'm glad you know her at JD. So, all right. So as Autumn said, I, my name is Natasha. I work at the South Florida Water Management District in the uh, permit acquisition and compliance section. That's part of a larger division of ecosystem restoration and capital projects. It's a lot of words that get flung around because you know it's a government organization. But basically my job is to apply for the permits for these large scale Everglades restoration projects and then you know, follow up on the compliance. So making sure that we're following all the conditions that are set out in our permits. So for those of you that don't know, um, there are five water management districts in the state of Florida. So the South Florida Water Management District obviously is in the Southern part of the state and covers roughly you know, 16 counties. So I'm going to throw around a couple terms today, um, and I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew what they meant before I started really talking. So an STA, or a stormwater treatment area, and an FEB, or a flow equalization basin. So the difference between these two areas is that an STA is created with the purpose of treating water or you know, to remove nutrients that are in the water, whereas a flow equalization basin that is not the purpose of it. A flow equalization basin or an FEB just exists to um, store water. It's a shallow water reservoir, basically. 
So an STA, what is an STA? We all know that they're pretty good places to go birding. We do a lot of field trips to these areas as part of these Audubon trips. Um, but STAs also are, um, they provide numerous downstream benefits because of that aspect of them where they treat the water and they remove nutrients from the water. So the whole purpose of an STA, they're created to treat water, to remove mostly phosphorus. And, you know, there's very strict monitoring guidelines that go along with STAs to, to look at the quality of the water that comes in and what's going to be released. So the water that is released from an STA is a lot cleaner than the water that comes into it. And that water is then sent downstream, which eventually, you know, makes its way to estuary. So it's improved water quality downstream as well as improved habitat for numerous species, um, both terrestrial and marine, since it goes all the way out to the oceans eventually. Um, you know, it's an amazing thing that these STAs do. And, you know, the wildlife, I could talk about the wildlife benefits all day long, but we do have to remember they also benefit us as people and not just for recreational pur purposes like birding, fishing, hunting, hiking, biking, um, but as well as flood protection. The SDAs do serve a purpose for flood protection. We can control the water that goes into them. So during storm events or prior to storm events, we can put extra water into STAs or draw down STAs, depending on where we think the water is going to fall to help protect you know, the populations of South Florida from being flooded. So it's, a, it's an aspect of them that we don't really think about um, too often. But so we all know, you know, STAs are pretty cool, but what, you know, what is an STA before it's an STA as we know it? Um, you know, this, this is something that I didn't really know about until I started this job. And it's a, a really involved process that I'm gonna go over today at a really high level. Um, this process takes sometimes, you know, almost a decade and hundreds and hundreds of people to, to make these STAs happen. So we're just gonna get a snapshot of it from a permitting perspective today. So STAs, most of the time, before an STA is an STA, um, it can be a fallow citrus grove, like the one pictured here. It can be um, pasture land, either fallow or, you know, sometimes we will lease land to, to farmers so that they maintain the land and keep it in good shape until we're ready to, to work on it. Or it could also be sugarcane fields. You know, a lot of these, um, the agricultural areas where sugarcane you know, a lot of our STAs are converted from sugarcane into an STA. So it's a, it's a really cool process that um, it's very complicated. You know, it's not an easy thing to just take one and make it into another. So, you know, to go from this to this, it takes some time. So one of the first steps in this process of creating a stormwater treatment area or an FEB or any of these restoration projects really is um, design. You know, you do the engineering designs and um, the design process is complicated. It takes a long time and it's done by many, many, many engineers that, um, you know, they're very good at their job. So they take into consideration every aspect of an SDA. So things that you don't even realize that are out there when you're looking at an STA, every single aspect of that STA was considered from the, the slopes of the levees to the grade of the dirt on top of the levees, where the handrails go, um, the capacity of the pumps, how big the generators are. Um, so many things go into these design processes. So it starts with a preliminary design all the way to a final design. There's lots of back and forth between agencies comparing the design processes. And a big part of these restoration projects is um, ensuring that there is a public access component to all these projects. So when they are completed, the public will be able to use them for recreational purposes like fishing, boating, um, hunting, birding, stuff like that. So it's a, it's a long process um, that takes takes a lot of work just for the design. 
Um, another step in the process early on is environmental surveys. So surveys that go out and look at the soils. We test the soils looking for any residual pesticides or herbicides that might be present. Is there any fuel or oil spills out there that we didn't know about? Um, we also will look for storage tanks on the property. What were those tanks holding? Was it oil? Was it gas? Was it something else? Are they on the property? Were they leaking? Were they maintained? You know, all these aspects um, we have to look at. And then engines, are, are there any engines on the site? So, you know, motors or pumps. Because um, a lot of times we can use those on other properties um, to, to save some money and not have to buy things, reuse them if they're just going to be removed from a site once construction begins. So we take all of these uh, things into consideration because we wanna know what's in that soil. Um, Cause the soil, you know, it's gonna be the basis of an STA and whatever is there will remain there when the area is flooded. So we have to know what's there so that we can know how to fix it. Um, once we, you know, before we create a wetland. So that brings into play the remediation part of this process. So the soil remediation is another really complicated process that involves, it, there's a lot of chemists that know how long different chemicals and metals last in the soil. Um, copper was a big one that we learned a lot about by creating these STAs and you know monitoring. So copper was used in, um, in, in agriculture and it stays in the soil for a long time. And what ended up happening is that snails, you know, when an area was flooded, when the STA was created and the area was flooded, snails would come in, they would eat, you know, algae and stuff off the bottom of the, the cell. <clears throat> and then the Everglades snail kite loves snails came in and would eat the snails. And we were finding, you know, somebody was finding that the kites were getting a high copper in their systems. So the district in coordination with the US Fish and Wildlife Service kind of came up with a plan or a, a way to remediate, to, to get rid of these contaminants in the soil. So not just copper, but other ones. Copper is the one that I can remember off the top of my head. But, you know, by, by doing this soil remediation, it, reduces the chances of this bioaccumulation of these, of these contaminants in wildlife. So one way of, of doing this remediation is soil mixing. It sounds really simple. Um, it's like a simple solution to a complicated problem, but really, you know, it's like the solution to pollution is dilution. So, um, you know, it's basically just tilling the soil based on those soil samples and those environmental surveys that we did preliminarily. Uh, we know how deep those contaminants are in the soil. So they're able to go ahead and kind of mix those top, you know, 10, 12, 14, however many inches of soil, but they mix them and retest. And many times just that mixing process of, of you know, stirring everything up dilutes them enough that it is, um, you know, the, the, the levels are brought down to a level that is acceptable uh, to, to be inundated. <clears throat> Another way of doing remediation is soil removal. So if it's, if it's uh, something that can't be diluted, if it's something that is not able to be removed from the soil or diluted in the soil like that, um, we just remove the soil from the site completely. So we'll bring in an excavator, which is shown here, um, that large yellow piece of equipment and just, you know, put the dirt into dump trucks and take it off site and we'll stockpile it elsewhere. And sometimes that dirt can be used within the project site to create levees or roads or even like a staging area for equipment. Um, or if not, it's just stockpiled elsewhere and um, it's left there. Always on our own property. We don't go put contaminated soils on other people's property. Um, but you know, we, we do ensure that contaminated soils are removed from these sites prior to um, the sites being inundated. 
So the next step or one of the steps that kind of happens concurrently during this process is wildlife and wetland surveys. Um, this is probably what we're gonna talk about the most today because it's the part that I'm the most involved in hands-on wise. But um, so prior to construction, we have to do wetland assessments on these project sites. And some of these sites, you know, they're, they're pretty big. They're thousands of acres. And we go out and we look at any remaining wetlands, if there are wetlands left on the project. So we'll look at, um, you know, are there invasive species in there? Is it mostly native species? Are the wetlands connected to any other wetlands or are they isolated? Um, you know, is it good habitat for wildlife? So based on the, the set of criteria that we have, we give the wetlands a rating and then these ratings go into our permitting packages, which we'll talk about in a, um, a couple slides. But we use all this information. This is all required um, so that we can, you know, show that we're not impacting wetlands um, too badly. We're not destroying wetlands. Um, but we also are able to show via this process that the wetlands that we are creating by creating an STA or an FEB will make up for any impacts to these wetlands that are not always in great condition. Most of the time, they're really, really full of Brazilian pepper and invasive species. So they're not really great functional wetlands. They're not connected to anything. They don't provide much of a benefit to the site. The other you know, part of the surveys that we do are the listed species surveys. We go ahead and we look for state and federally listed species that might be utilizing these sites. Um, the reason we do this is because once the construction process begins, we wanna make sure that we're not negatively impacting any of these animals that are using the sites. Um, so this information you know, also goes to the agencies when we apply for our permits. So speaking of permitting, it's everybody's favorite topic, I know. So I'm going to try to be real high level and brief with this one. So the permitting that we do, um, it, it's very, it's kind of involved. But so once we have our engineering designs, our remediation reports, our wildlife reports, our wetland reports, our supporting documentation, um, everything that we have, we compile that all with the applications and we submit those to the regulatory agencies. The two agencies that we tend to deal with the most are the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, and the US Army Corps of Engineers, which I'll probably just call the Corps or the Corps of Engineers because it's a long name. So during this permitting process, um, you know, we submit applications to both agencies. So while the review process is happening with DEP, we, um, through that agency, we will receive feedback from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission on any state list of species that might be present and how to coordinate efforts with them once construction begins on getting permits if they're needed, avoiding impacts and things like that. Uh, while the process is going on with the US Army Corps of Engineers, we receive what's called a biological opinion from the US Fish and Wildlife Service or a BO, um, because you know, we're the government and we love acronyms. So we get our biological opinion, we get our BO for any federally listed species that are on the project site. So that BO kind of tells us what we need to do for each federally listed species that's on the site, how big a buffer zone needs to be around a nest, um, you know, what speed limit to have on the site, things like that. So, you know, this permitting process takes sometimes seven to 10 months, maybe a year to actually go from submitting permit applications to getting permits in hand. And during that time, there will be site visits to the site from the regulatory agencies. There will be back and forth questions. Um, so it's a long process. So it takes a long time um, to get all of that kind of squared away. But then finally, after all our hard work, um, we're able to get our permits in hand and we're able to begin the construction and compliance part of the process. So, you know, let's say now in this design process, so from the day the design process started to the day we get permits, sometimes it's 10 years um, for some of these projects. So it, it take, it's a long process. 
all right, so we have our permits in hand and we're actually able to start construction. So I'm gonna say my role in this is to uh, ensure that our contractors and ourselves, that we are adhering to all the, the conditions that are laid out in our permits. They're very, very specific conditions in permits regarding construction, best management practices, how often to test, um, you know, do turbidity sampling, for example, um, things like that. So it's, we had, there's a lot of boxes to check to make sure that we're following the rules. Additionally, the uh, Department of Environmental Protection does come out to these sites pretty regularly to do compliance site visits. And the Army Corps can come out anytime, the Fish and Wildlife Service or the Fish and Wildlife Commission. They can visit these sites at any time. So it's really important, not just because we're being watched necessarily, but it's important to, to make sure that we're doing the right thing and we're following our permits. So it's it's our job in my group, my colleagues and I, that we we make sure that um, the rules are being followed, the instructions and the permits are being adhered to. And one of the first things that we actually go over with anybody who works on any of our project sites, whether they are a district employee, a contractor, a contractor who's worked on several of our projects before, um, we go over the threatened endangered species training. So we have several trainings at the district that go, go over the threatened endangered species. And we stress species that will be found on these project sites what the speed limits are on the project sites, what to do if they see a listed species, um, which ones they need to get us a location for, which ones they need to stay away from, um, stuff like that. You know, it's, it's um, we go into specifics regarding the buffer zones for some of the nesting bird species that they can't work within those zones um, during nesting season or while a nest is active. So it's a lot of um, information that we throw at these contractors, but we try to make sure that they have fun and that they understand that we're on their side, that they can call us if they have any questions. So, um, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, but so first, everybody, first step, day one, everybody gets this threatened and endangered species training. So I'm just gonna go through several slides kind of showing really cool construction equipment in action. Um, so this is a project site. This will be an STA in the future. Um, so this is actually, this excavator is removing um, kind of sediment buildup in the bottom of this canal. So this canal will be an inflow outflow canal for an STA when it's done. Um, this whole area used to be a sugarcane field. Now it looks like this. Um, you can see in the background, the adjacent farm is a sugarcane field as well. So that's what this looked like. So these canals are built in segments. So we remove the sedimentation so that once the canals are completed and connected, that there's not a lot of stuff on the bottom of them. There's not a lot of buildup um, that will inhibit the flow of water through these canals. We want the water to be able to flow at maximum capacity to get in and out the most water possible. Uh, this photo shows a um, visit by the Department of Environmental Protection to that same STA site. So here we're looking at the newly sodded slopes. So sod is used to stabilize the slopes. Um, so here we're looking at sod that was just laid as well as work that's being done on the other side of the canal. So during these site visits, the, the inspectors from DEP have a, pre, a set of predetermined photo points. So they'll take a picture at the same point each visit. And some, sometimes these visits are monthly, sometimes they're quarterly. So the photos just give them a nice way to kind of document the change between each visit. Um, and so they can see what's going on at the site and how it changes. Uh, we do have to wear personal protective equipment while we're on site. So that's why we all have our, our vests on. So this picture, this is actually going to be the bottom of an STA cell. Um, I like this photo because it kind of shows it's kind of un, uneven right now. There's piles of rocks everywhere. And the reason for all the, the piles of rocks is that this, this, this site had a very hard bottom. It's all rock. 
And the only way that they can get it to be at grade or at, you know, to meet those design specifications laid out in the design plans, you know, it, it says what level the, the floor, the bottoms of these STAs have to be. So the way they get to that level at this site is by blasting the site. So they, they blast the site and then the, the, the rock that's left over, so that's all these piles of rock that are shown in this photo, um, piles of rock are then broken down into smaller pieces of rock and then used to create the levees. So there's, you know, waste not, want not on these projects. We, re we use anything that we can. So this is a picture of what it looks like before it's blasted. So this yellow piece of equipment kind of in the center of the photo there, that is a drilling rig. It does exactly what it sounds like. It drills down into the earth. They place an explosive down there. So each of these cardboard tubes has an explosive in it with like, it's, it's almost like a Looney Tunes cartoon. You know, it has like a fuse at the end of it and then they light it. But um. You know they drill they drill down they they set these fuses and then they'll blast it and it blasts in a sequence and that's how they make canals cell bottoms stuff like that so it's really impressive to to watch I don't have a video of it unfortunately so you'll just have to believe me that's impressive but um it it's pretty cool to to see how they do it and they can do it so precisely that they can get this to be at the correct grade after you know blowing it up. So here's an example of where we don't have to um, use explosives to get to the, the right elevation of a cell. So this site um, is an old citrus grove. And the citrus grove here, you know, it had a, it's very sandy. So we're able to use uh, this piece of equipment that I don't actually know what it's called. We always just call it the grater. And um, the, the the contractors know what we're talking about. So maybe that's what it's called. But um, so this piece of equipment is able to go across these fields after we approve them going through these fields, making sure there's no wildlife present. Um, they go across the fields and it removes just a, a few inches of soil at a time. And they just go, they make several passes, you know, they dump the soil somewhere, they come back, they make several passes and then they're able to get the, an area to the right level. So once the area is at the correct level, um, surveyors come in, survey the area, confirm that it's at the grade specified in the designs, and then it's um, it's approved by our QA, QC folks, and the contractor is able to go and work on the next section of the project. So it's um, it's pretty interesting, you know, how that happens. Um, it happens really, you know, pretty fast too with this, you know, this, this, these photos, it's, it's after one pass of this grader, this is what it looks like. Uh, so this project is actually kind of interesting. So what's happening here is these contractors are building a water control structure, but there's no water. So I was, I was confused. I was like, why are we building a weir where there's no water? So it's actually this area that's cleared is going to be a canal in a few years. So they were building the weir before they built the canal because it would be easier to work out of the water. So I thought that was interesting, but you know, so they still have all their, um, you know, protective measures in place. They have silt fencing, they have um, all the stuff in place to, to prevent erosion and stuff like that. So these are things that we look at when we go to the site. But I thought that was clever to, to build the water control structure out of the water so that it was there when the water came in. Um, so sometimes we do have to watch out for wildlife during construction. Um, so in this photo, my colleague, some of you might recognize him, is keeping an eye out on a canal that is adjacent to these structures. So there's a house and a smaller structure that kind of looks like it has three R2D2s on it. Uh, those are old engines. Um, so those two structures were being, uh, were being removed and there's a canal just adjacent, just on the, the far side of these. And that canal 
is accessible to manatees. So we had to be present during, while this work was taking place to watch for manatees in the canal. So if we saw one, we would stop work in case anything fell into the canal, we wouldn't injure a manatee. Um, we additionally, we did survey the house and the structures for any bats or snakes prior to them being removed so that they weren't injured in the process. So this structure here is, um, it's a future part of an FEB. So this is going to be the outflow structure of an FEB. And one day, one of the contractors called us and said that there was a burrowing owl hanging out in this outflow structure. So first we were really happy that somebody actually listened to our wildlife training and called us when they saw something. And so then we went out to the site and um, you know, we went to inspect the site. So this, the photo is a little deceiving. We have to climb down a ladder to get to this. So it's actually kind of underground. They dewatered and built this structure. And um, so the owl had been hanging out in this area that kind of looks like a cave. Um, you know, it's underground, it's dark. So I was looking for the owl and then I looked to the side and the owl was staring at me. And it had been there for a few weeks and the, the workers were done in this particular spot. They didn't mind the owl being there. They were okay avoiding the area. Um, the owl obviously didn't mind being around them. So we just kind of let it be. We checked on him from time to time. And um, when breeding season came along, um, he left and he went off to do his thing. So it was kind of cool. We checked it out afterwards and we actually did find like little bones and stuff of where it had been eating. So, you know, it's one example that in this case, we were able to just kind of let, let the animal be, do its thing. It wasn't impacting anything and, and it, you know, wasn't hurting construction. So this next slide is a video. We'll see if it works. So some of you might recognize these birds. Um, if you don't, these are lease terns. And those of you that know anything about lease terns know that they will show up kind of wherever they want when it's time to nest. And especially when we build, especially when we build perfect looking lease turn habitat, like in this photo. So this is a project where we were regrading the bottom of an STA. Um, you know, the STA had been operations for a long time. The, we wanted to regrade it to make it level, to make it function um, better. So, you know, uh, on our team, we were like, this area is going to attract lease turns for sure. So we were monitoring the site weekly um, when we thought that the birds were going to show up. So then once they showed up, uh, we were ready for them. And we, uh, we had all the supplies we needed in the bed of our truck. So we went ahead and threw some signs together and were able to post um, the, the nesting area right away the day that we discovered birds. So we used two different types of signs. And um, I should say that we do coordinate with the Fish and Wildlife Commission. So when we do discover a nesting colony, we do notify them of the presence of the birds. And then we go ahead and post the colony. And um, We'll use two different types of signage. You know, we'll put the, the least turn signs either on sandwich boards or on kind of tall stakes, just depending on the area where we are. A lot of times it's hard to, to, to dig in. So we use the sandwich bar boards more often. Um, we'll alternate sandwich board and traffic cone and create a nice large posted area. And we always put the signs far enough away from the birds that we're not flushing or disturbing the birds while we're putting out our signs. So we'll go ahead and monitor um, the colony until nesting is complete. So there are all the birds have fledged and left, and then we'll go ahead and okay work to continue in that area. So sometimes it can be a few months, but the contractors understand and they go and, and they can they work in other areas. And just because they're my favorites, um, just a couple of pictures. So here's some lease turns that we had um, 
I think this year at, at the at the site that was pictured, um, just kind of hanging out in the water that was pooled after it rained one day. And then I really like this picture. It's not the best quality wise, but I like it because the black neck stilt looks like a Godzilla walking through the least turns. Like he's so much bigger than the rest of them. So another species that we do often come across on our projects are is um, the gopher tortoise. So several of us on our team are authorized gopher tortoise agents with the Fish and Wildlife Commission. So we are trained uh, to uh, in the removal of gopher tortoises. So this gopher tortoise pictured here, um, his the burrow went under a road and it was compromising the integrity of the road. We were about to have some large equipment driving back and forth out there for some repairs, and we were afraid that the burrow would collapse. So after coordination with the gopher tortoise biologist, it was determined that the, the best course of action was to go ahead and excavate the burrow. And uh, so we did that, and the way that's done is an authorized agent works with a backhoe operator. So this is a backhoe, a piece of equipment. And based on hand signals that the gopher tortoise agent gives, the backhoe operator will remove just a one or two inches of soil at a time from the mouth of the burrow back a few feet. And that way we work in sections all the way to the end chamber of the burrow um, until we end, until we find the tortoise. So if we find the tortoise before the end of the burrow, um, you know, we remove the tortoise, check it out, make sure it's healthy, uh, put it in a carrier and into the shade or in the air condition. Um, and then we will excavate to the end of the burrow. You always have to go to the end to make sure that there's no other tortoises present, as well as no other commensal species. Um, you know, a lot of snakes and it, um, use burrows as well. So we want to make sure that we're not impacting them. Speaking of animals that burrow. We already had one appearance of a burrowing owl, but I will sit, uh, just say again that we do uh, um, sometimes get burrowing owls on our project sites. So burrowing owls are also a state protected species. So in most cases, we're able to avoid the burrows and just let them be. Um, but every once in a while, there is a case where an, a, an owl burrow, it, it needs to be removed. You know, if an area is gonna be flooded, if habitat is going to be significantly modified, then you know the the area does have to be um, the, the the owl has to be removed. The the burrow has to be removed. So what we do before that is we coordinate with the Fish and Wildlife Commission and obtain um, permits for this work, and then we create habitat. So we'll either we will install artificial burrows or put in starter burrows nearby. Um, that the owls will be able to use after um, their burrow is excavated. So then once we've created the artificial or starter burrows, we will scope the burrow that the owl is using and ensure that it's inactive. And what that means is that there are no eggs or chicks present in the burrow. And that is the only time that a burrow can be excavated. If there are eggs or chicks present, no work will be done. So, you know, once it's determined that the burrow is inactive, we'll go ahead and excavate it and then work has to take place within 48 hours. That's a permit mandate. So that doesn't happen too often, but, you know, it does happen. Another state listed species that we will come across from time to time are the sandhill cranes. Um, they, they do nest, you know, kind of on the ground in the marshes. So we will from time to time see them nesting in our STAs. More often than not, we'll see the chicks, the adults and the chicks walking around. Um, and we didn't find the nests, but sometimes we do see the nests. And if we do, we'll um, notify water managers so that the water levels in the STA can be kept down or kept at the same level that they're at when we find the nests so that the nests aren't endangered. So sometimes we get to play with things that aren't birds. Um, so here we are doing some bat surveys. So um, there, I've, all species of bat in Florida are protected under state law. And then there's one species of bat, the Florida bonneted bat, which is federally listed. It's um, a federally endangered species. 
So in these two photos, we are looking for Florida bonneted bats. So anytime our work is taking place within the bat consultation area, the Florida bonneted bat consultation area, which is uh, established by the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, we have to do bat surveys. So those surveys are kind of twofold. One part involves uh, putting out acoustic recording equipment. So we'll put out acoustic recording, recording equipment for several nights and it will record from sunset to sunrise anytime a certain frequency triggers the recording device. So we program the device to recognize a circuit, certain frequency or frequency range. And then when the, that range is detected, the devices record. We then take all the equipment back to the office, use a specialized software to analyze it and see what species were detected. The other aspect of bat surveys is what is pictured here, doing emergence surveys. So my colleague Courtney on the left, she's holding in her hand um, kind of like a live recording device that it shows her on her phone with like an attachment that shows her what species are flying overhead based on their calls that it picks up. So we kind of get a live snapshot of what's flying overhead. And then the photo on the right is me looking into a bat box thinking that I could tell the difference between the hundreds of bats looking down at me, but I couldn't. So they all just looked like bats. And then I think the part about bat surveys that nobody talks about is that bats like areas with mosquitoes. Um, so if any of you ever go to watch bats emerge from places, there's gonna be mosquitoes around. Um, so you can look as fashionable as me and wear a mosquito suit because I was the happiest of all my colleagues. Um, another species that we will come across sometimes are black rails. I've never actually seen a black rail. I have heard them a few times, but um, we will do black rail surveys uh, in coordination with the US Fish and Wildlife Service since they are now a federally listed species. Um, the way we survey for them is during breeding season, we'll do callback surveys. So again, we do this under permission in coordination with the Fish and Wildlife Service um, so that we're not disturbing a listed species by playing calls. Um, you know, so we'll do the, the callbacks. If the birds call back, they're there. Um, we assume that presence during nesting season means that nesting is occurring. Um, you know, we don't go looking for the nest through the, the marshes because it's just dangerous to do that. And, you know, we can, we just hold off construction until nesting is complete and we no longer hear callbacks if construction is going to take place at all. So here's just an example of an area where we had to do black rail surveys recently. So this is the bottom of the reservoir. Um, so before we put water in there, there was a lot of standing rainwater, so it created nice puddles here and there. And at one point during construction, some um, surveyors did hear black rail calls. So, you know, prior to inundation, well after nesting season, we went out to um, just double check and make sure that we didn't get any callbacks, that there were no, you know, that nesting wasn't really, wasn't occurring. And um, so we went down into the reservoir and just for you know perspective, here's where our cars were parked, and then that we were at the bottom of that um, levee right there. So we you know we did our due diligence to ensure that no nesting was occurring before the reservoir had any water in it. Um, another species that will show up often is the Everglades snail kite. So basically, as soon as we get water into any of the STAs or FEBs and snails show up, the snail kites will show up right behind them. And so snail kites, you know, they are federally listed species and um, we do, we'll look for snail kite activity. Once we see any activity, we notify the Fish and Wildlife Service and we notify the University of Florida. The University of Florida does the majority of snail kite surveys in the state. So they'll come out, they'll survey the area, they'll let us know where the nests are, and then we map it and see if any nests are within 500 feet of a levee. If they are within 500 feet of a levee, we then close that levee so that there is a no entry zone, um, a no entry buffer within 500 feet of snail kite nests. So nobody's allowed in. 
So we'll close down levees. And this means this levee is closed to everyone, pedestrians, um, vehicles, district staff, everybody. If anybody needs to get through there, they need to call and they need to have a good reason. And then we have to get permission from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So, you know, we, we do, um, we take these rules very seriously and make sure that we're in compliance with them. So here's a photo taken uh, by a colleague. He was able to go out with University of Florida on one of their surveys. So it's two snail kite chicks in, in a nest. And then at the bottom was just a bunch of um, old snail shells, which I thought was kind of cool. All the remnants of all their meals was at the bottom um, underneath their nest. All right, more birds with large buffer areas when they're nesting. So the crested caracara shows up quite often on some of our project sites. And um, these birds are very picky about what they'll nest in sometimes. But caracara, to do these surveys, nesting surveys are very involved. And, um, you know, we have to be in place at our survey, at our survey location, um, half an hour before sunrise. So this means a lot of early mornings for us, sometimes leaving the office at 4 a.m. Uh, to get to the project sites before dawn and be in place. And, you know, nesting season is during the coldest time of the year. And, you know, it starts in like December or January. So we're out there and it's usually freezing because we're on the interior of the state. So um, we do it for the birds, we love them. But so once we establish that nesting is taking place, we um, put in place a buffer zone and the buffer zone for Crested Caracara is 1500 meters. So it's a very, very large buffer zone for this species. And within that buffer zone, no work can take place. So until nesting is complete, that 1500 meter buffer zone, no ground moving can happen. No construction activities can happen within that area. We will allow people if traffic you know, what's happening, sometimes we will continue to allow traffic, but in most cases, all activities cease within that buffer zone. Sometimes it's really hard to find the nests and we have to kind of be creative. So here I am acting as a tripod for a colleague since she's uh, quite a bit taller than me. I was like the perfect height for her to put the spotting scope on my shoulder and for her to find the nest that was in a clump of Brazilian pepper. So the Eastern indigo is a, another federally listed species that we sometimes get to work with. This is actually one of the coolest animals that I've ever had the privilege to be able to work with. They're such elusive snakes and they're so amazing to look at. So this snake on the in the left uh, hand picture is being handled under permits. It's being handled by a researcher. So we, we were not handling the snake, um, but it's a really good picture because you can see kind of the iridescence in the, in the scales. Um, they're just like a beautiful color. So, you know, sometimes we'll find them on our project site. So the photo on the right there shows an indigo snake that a contractor took um, to, and sent to me that he had seen it. And it was seen a few times. It was actually living under one of the construction trailers. And, um, you know, we report these obser observations to the, the Fish and Wildlife Service. And um, it's just, it's really cool to be able to see them and work with them. In one or two um, um, occurrences, we've had times where, because an area is gonna be completely inundated when it's, when it's finished, you know, deep, like a deep water reservoir. And if there are indigo snakes present on the site with permission from the service and FWC, we were able to be part of a captive breeding program where the snakes were uh, taken to a captive breeding site, any that we, we were able to, to catch. And they're able then to increase the genetic diversity of um, the population in the wild. So it's a, it's a cool program to be a part of. Um, that, you know, the snakes, instead of being in an area that's going to be a deep water reservoir, then go on to, to, to be part of a bettering their species and increasing the chances of survival in the future. So it's not just listed species that we will protect. 
Um, you know, this killdeer, we found a nest near her. So we put out cones or bean bags or something around the, around the area to notify staff that there is a nest present and that they should be careful in the area. Same thing with these vulture chicks. We found this vulture nest. It was underneath a collapsed uh, pump house. So the, the roof had collapsed and a vulture had gone underneath and nested. And when some contractors came along and they removed part of the collapsed structure, they found these chicks under, under the roof. And um, they were able to, to grab them, put them in a box with some you know, newspaper and paper towels. And we, were, we then took them to Bush Wildlife where they were, they were able to be raised and hopefully released. Uh, we do see bald eagles from time to time, which is always exciting. So um, this juvenile bald eagle, I saw him out of the corner of my eye. I thought it was a snail kite because I was watching a bunch of snail kites. And when I looked, I realized it was bald eagle. Um, we do have bald eagle nests on some of our STAs um, in, the north, in the northern STAs. And um, you know, if we do find a bald eagle nest or know of a bald eagle nest, when it is active, we do implement a 660 foot buffer around that nest. So again, no activity can take place within that 660 feet. Uh, but it's not just wildlife that we're trying to protect. We try to protect ourselves as well. It's hard to see in this picture, but um, this tree had a hole in it. And in that hole was a bunch of bees. And um, the contractors were gonna be working in this area in a few days, actually removing some of the trees. And um, you know, we notified them that there was a beehive in it to make sure that people were in a closed cab um, so that they wouldn't get stung by the bees. So we keep an eye out for that kind of stuff. You know, there's boar sometimes on some of the project sites, things like that. And sometimes, you know, we have some minor field mishaps. Um, in this instance, um, this truck managed to find a culvert that had collapsed in the road. I'd driven over it before them, and then um, their truck just fell through this culvert. They were fine. The truck was fine. We were able to get the truck out. Um, it's just an example that, you know, it's not all uh, roses and sunshine on field days. Sometimes there are some minor mishaps. Uh, sometimes your equipment overheats and you have to push it along. So um, in this case, our, um, our UTV had overheated and we had to push it until help came. So once we get through the design, the permitting, the environmental surveys, all the compliance, we're able to enter initial operations. So in this case, the STA is built, it's ready to be used. So we turn on the pumps and we start putting in a little bit of water and we see what kind of vegetation starts to grow. We look at that, we look at, um, you know, is it native vegetation? Is it not native vegetation? Are we going to plant vegetation or are we just going to let it naturally recruit? We look at the pumps. Are the pumps working to full capacity? Can we alter the flow? Are the levees um, structurally sound? Are they leaking? You know, we look at all these different aspects of it and the water quality, you know, we, we monitor the water quality very, very, very closely um, to see, you know, what's happening with the water in this STA. Is it being treated? Um, what can we do differently? Stuff like that. So we try to answer a lot of questions. And then once this initial operations period is done, sometimes it can take over a year. Um, then the STA enters what's called operations and that's when it'll be open to the public. So, you know, it takes a lot of steps. It takes a lot of people. And this was a really, really kind of high level overview of a little bit of what goes into um, making these places happen. So before I leave you for tonight, I'm gonna play this, this video. We had a game camera out at one of our project sites and we had it out for about a week. Um, and we just wanted to see kind of what we would capture on the camera. So I'm gonna go ahead and let the video start. It's a little over a minute long.
got a lot of footage of this one bobcat. It really liked this area. Those Karakara are my favorite. Like, what were they doing just walking down the road? All right, so and that, with that, that concludes my presentation. I do want to say um, thank you to all the people that I work with. Teamwork definitely makes the dream work, and I wouldn't be able to do any of this without my team. I guess we are each other's team. It's not my team. We are each other's team. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm happy to take any questions. That, that was awesome. Thank you. Um, uh, there were a ton of questions that started coming in right away at the beginning. So I'm going to try and get through as many as I can. Some people ask questions that then um, Holly Andriotta answered. Okay. So, Thank you, Holly. <laughs> so we got, we got some answers up there, but uh, I, I just want to start with uh, my favorite question, um, which is what's difficult about your job and do you get to play in the mud? <laughs> I think I answered that question a little yeah. bit during the presentation. Um, I think the hardest part about the job is kind of coordinating all the different people to get us um, all the information we need to submit these permit applications. So it's a lot of uh, people moving and people coordination. People are always the hardest part. And yeah. yes, I get to play in the mud a lot. <laughs> all right. So there's a lot of uh, animals questions. So uh, Penny Prey said, considering that helping wildlife is one of the purposes, why is hunting of birds and alligators allowed on what's essentially created a preserve that the that they gravitate to? That's a really good question. And I wish I had a better answer. I'll be honest, I don't completely have an answer to this question. Um, I know some of my colleagues are on here, maybe Holly can chime in. I know that, you know, um, hun hunters are a big part of the, the stakeholder community. We do take a lot of feedback from them. And, you know, hunting, hunting is allowed. It, it's a recreational activity. So um, that's, that's my answer. It's not great. And I apologize. No, no. And I might I be able get... to. Yeah, go ahead, Holly. Um, you know, we coordinate with a lot of stakeholders through the permitting process. And it we're definitely getting money from the state and federal governments. And we're trying to include a lot of different uses within our project footprint. And that includes hunters um, and birders. Um, birders can be just impactful as a hunter can in some of our areas if they're not following our protection measures. So it's really important to know the rules and regard the signage that's posted and you know, if cones are there, they're there for a reason. Do not go through them. We've had a lot of instances where people just move cones, you know, um, and they're there for a reason. So we try to work with Audubon, we work with birders, we work with hunters, and there's so many stakeholders involved in our process from the very beginning at the permitting stages through construction and operations. And we're trying to make everybody happy. And you know those species that are allowed to be hunted, there's certain recommendations and rules um, that the hunters must follow and lotteries and things like that for ducks and gators um, that are followed and FWC patrols those areas to make sure that they are followed. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> um, that was really helpful. So, um, Let's see. Uh, so, ha, 
Yeah. How is uh, how is a potential site identified? Um, do you have who purchases it? Okay, so potential sites. So um, the district will they have a whole real estate group. So they look at um, areas to be purchased. So a lot of times it's you know farm fields that can be converted. Um, does the site have to be purchased? We do own the properties, yes. So we do purchase the properties, we do own them. Um, I do believe it's part of that a cost share agreement for these large restoration projects. Um, there's a cost share agreement between um, us and the federal government. So I believe that's where the money comes from to buy these projects. I'm not 100% sure. Again, these are really, really I know they're questions, like guys. <laughs> Wait, um, but yeah, so like the district or the um, U.S. Army Corps is our partner. So that they, those would be the ones I buy, but we own all the STAs and stuff. Those are our property in perpetuity. Cool. Um, so speaking of buying, when U.S. Sugar originally sold land for reservoirs, and then, <laughs> here's another heavy question, and then arsenic was discovered in the soil. Um, why wasn't, why didn't they know before they bought it? Um, I don't think that, you know, th those surveys weren't done before the properties were bought. There are ways of remediating that soil and getting rid of the arsenic. Um, you know, arsenic is also kind of a naturally occurring substance in some cases, not always, especially not when it's an agricultural field. Um, but, you know, there are ways of remediating that and, and the, the remediation process has come a long way in the decades that we've been doing this work. So some of our sites actually do have arsenic contamination and we are able to remediate it and, and remove that. Um, but, you know, I think when we buy the lands, we don't always do all these surveys before the purchase. Cool. A lot of times the surveys um, are, are done and maybe we don't know everything because you take a random kind of sample and you do transects. So we do have a really good idea of what's on the property before we purchase it, but it has to do with what land is available in the flow paths and what land is available for purchase. So there's certain footprints that are needed to make sure the projects work in conjunction with each other. And those are the lands that we try to acquire. Not everybody wants to sell, so we can't just take people's property. So you, but once sometimes when we get more involved after the purchase, we do additional research and we have a really good division at the district who is very experienced with this and they'll go in after even the purchase and do more uh, sampling <clears throat> and go into more of an in-depth survey of what's what we have. And we have to expect these lands are impacted because of the many decades of cultivation and farming. Yeah, so, and, you know, we look we look at that. We do, you know, as as we were saying, you know, we do look at that and we have a whole team that goes into all of that stuff. So it's not always within our, you know, we don't always have power over what's in there, but we can do the best with what we have when we get it. Excellent. Um, so there's a I like this next question about the pythons. Right, right. So, yeah. so, and Holly answered it, but we'll we we'll go back to it. So, um, uh, uh, the there's a let me see. I lost the question up here. I got it. Is, is the SFW you, actively looking for invasive yeah. pythons? So yeah, we do. We, there's a python team. Um, you know, if Holly answered it. We can go on. But yeah, um, there is a python team at the district, and we all we all keep an eye out as well. And all the, all our different project sites, not just you know, adjacent to Lock Satchi Wildlife Refuge, but in, in all the STAs and all project sites that are going to be STAs or FEBs or anything like that, we keep an eye out. Yeah. And then, and Holly said there's over 50 hunters. Yeah. So that's, they're watching out. Um, now, when you, uh, back uh, to the gopher tortoises, to the tortoises, where do you relocate them to? And how do they, um, how do they do once they're there? So we have um, we have our own recipient site at the district. So I know this is a very environmental group. They might have heard a lot of the stuff that's going on right now. So the district, we actually have our own recipient site where we will take the tortoises um, when when they need to be removed from project sites. So it, it's up near Okeechobee, and you know we do surveys. Um, 
at least yearly up there. We go out there more than that to check on the site. And the tortoises seem to be doing really well. We recite marked tortoises often. You know, we'll mark the tortoises when we release them. And then um, sometimes we'll find them again roaming the site in a completely different area from where we released them as well. So, you know, when we release them, we have to dig a little starter burrow for them and they never use what we dig. Um, you know, we're inferior at digging burrows. So, um, yeah, but they seem to be doing well at our recipient site. That's a good question. Excellent. Yeah. And so, and talking about, you know, relocating animals or, um, Penny Prey asks about the bees. Um, why did you remove the trees if the trees aren't invasive? So those trees were, um, in the bank of a canal that needed to be um, redone. The, the canal bank needed to be redone. So unfortunately those trees did have to be removed. But when, whenever possible, we don't remove trees. And if possible, you know, um, if there are bees in structures or anything like that, we will try to remove the bees and not kill them. And then I, ha I have to ask you this question and I don't know how you're gonna answer it, but that, uh, aren't you forcing mother nature to go backwards? Um, this is Paul, uh, Paul Sprecht, or Specht asked that question. Um, do you have? So what do we, I don't um, like to go back to, well, we're restoring wetlands. I guess you're restoring it, yeah. yeah. But I wouldn't say that, I mean, this is for you to answer, but uh, I mean. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I, I think I can kind of see the, the point um, Paul, if you want to add to your question, you know, you can add it in the chat and we'll, we'll see. But, um, yeah, yeah. you know, I think we, we're kind of just restoring wetlands. These areas were Everglades historically, you know, and we are kind of restoring that flow of water uh, to the south so that, you know, there's a more natural pattern again. And we're creating cleaner water that results in better um, habitat for wildlife as well as better habitat for us as people. Cool. I'm sorry, Paul, if that doesn't answer your question pretty good answer. Um, how long has have SDAs been around in the state? Oh, you know, I've asked this question a couple of times and I always forget the answer. I want to say about 20 years, um, but I could be wrong. I'm sorry. I don't have it in my brain. <laughs> so, sounds good. That sounds good. Uh, we'll go with it. I, I, and do they monitor, like how is the success monitored? So it's very detailed, the monitoring. Um, there are dozens of monitoring stations within the SDAs that are, we have a whole water quality group at the district that could talk a lot about this, but there are water, there's monitoring stations that collect samples and it's an automatic sampling unit. And then those um, samples are analyzed and it's, you know, we look at the amount that comes in and the amount that comes out. We can monitor it in each cell of an STA as well. So as it travels through STAs, we can see how much nutrients are being taken out. And then part of one of our permit requirements is actually to meet a certain standard. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it can be different for different STAs, but water can't be released until it meets that standard. And then, um, you know, are close to that standard, but you know, it, it's monitored very closely by DEP and we have to submit compliance monitoring reports yearly and um, all kinds of stuff. So it's, there's lots of monitoring locations within the STAs. Cool. And uh, just some little last few questions. What bird species were you holding in your intro photo? You that remember? is actually from my old job. Um, that was when I worked with the Fish and Wildlife Commission. We were banding American oyster catchers in the Lake Worth Lagoon. So it was an American oyster catcher chick. And um, la um, last question. Um, there's some great responses. Everybody was really excited about your presentation, like so many. Um, but this last question uh, is, couldn't you use a native ground cover instead of sod? Why do you use the sod? Um, it's up to the contractor usually, but um, you know, the sod, it, it's just something to hold the banks. Usually within, um, it doesn't take long for kind of native, native little weeds and flowers to start growing up in there. Cool. Well, this was awesome. Um, I really enjoyed it. I'm gonna turn it back over to the press. <laughs> to Scott. Um, and uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys very much.
All right, Scott, come back. There he is. I'm coming, I'm coming. Okay, so wow, that was a great presentation, Natasha. I mean, it's, I learned so much about the STAs, thank you. Um, and I think we all are interested because we have field trips there. They're such an important part of our South Florida environment. And I think you kind of gave us a great overview, plus your personal experience. One quick question. Yes. Can you name all of the things that we saw in that, in that closing video? Oh God, uh, yeah, hold on. Let me look at it one more time. It was, there were bobcats, um, possum, a red shoulder hawk, a panther, Kara Kara, and I think that was it. Okay. It's yeah. funny, all the things you named, I missed the red shouldered hawk. <laughs> it, it randomly flew into a bush and then like, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, great, great. That was great. That was, and that was over 24 hours. And that was over a week. A week, okay. I, week. I watched about 2000 videos for oh us gosh. to make that, that clip, yeah. Okay, wow. That's great though. And <laughs> it was great watching the, the Kara Kara walk across. And by the way, you mentioned that you're wearing uh, Kara Kara earrings. Do you want to like show them, <laughs> show them to us <laughs> before you go? <laughs> great. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Natasha. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, next month on September 6th, uh, please join us for Dr. George Archibald, the uh, co-founder of the International Crane Foundation who will be presenting on whooping cranes are still whooping. A remarkable recovery of the whooping crane. We look forward to seeing you then. Have a wonderful evening. Have a wonderful month. Get out there and start birding again. And we look forward to seeing you. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a great night. Someone. April Benton. A little late. Let's make sure we um, keep that chat. Alarm. Fine. April, uh, I notice you just joined us, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the evening is over, but we will be posting this on our YouTube uh, channel. So if you want to see the presentation, you'll be able to see it there. Okay. Sorry you missed it. So uh, I'm going to uh, end the presentation. And uh, so I'm going to say a final good night and I'm going to I'm going to end it for for everybody. Uh, have a great night, everybody. Sure.